everyone and thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you all with us for the third session this week. We're very grateful to have Matthias Egger joining us today from the Ocean Cleanup. Then just a final note, if you haven't joined um, for any of the previous sessions in the series, uh, there's frequently a lot of negative news these days around uh, global affairs as well as um, in particular environmental things, whether it be climate change or plastic pollution. So in particular with this series, we're looking to really emphasize some of the organizations that are doing incredible work for the environment and for communities around them. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our speaker for the day, Matthias, whenever you're ready, you can bring up your slides and take it away. Right. Thank you for this really nice introduction and hello everyone. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, it's really a pleasure to you know, be able to talk to you guys about the work we do at the Ocean Cleanup. And so today I'll focus on you know, plastic in the ocean. Where is it coming from? What happens to it in the ocean? And how do we use that knowledge to try to clean it up? And so just very briefly who I am, I'm, I'm Matthias Egger. I'm part of the research team at the Ocean Cleanup. I did my PhD in marine biogeochemistry and pollutant dynamics. So that's a bit my background. And I'm currently the project lead for the Ocean Cleanup's offshore research data collection and operations. So usually you find me in the field or rather on or in the ocean, you now trying to understand uh, where's the plastic in the ocean? What does it look like? Where's it coming from? What happens to it? And what kind of harm is it doing to marine life? And so as, as I guess all of you know, there's a problem with plastic, especially mismanaged plastic waste. Uh, and lots of it is actually entering the ocean through rivers. Um, here you see some blue dots around the world. So those are model estimates of riverine inputs of plastic into the ocean. Um, the larger the dots, the more is estimated to actually enter the ocean from those rivers. And, and there are different estimates, but they all range in a couple of a uh, few million tons per year reaching our oceans. And I'm just adding some photos here that we took from, for example, the uh, Rio Ozama in the Dominican Republic. We see lots of plastic floating at the surface. And then also another extreme example is the Mutagua River in Guatemala. We barely see the water anymore because there's just so much uh, plastic waste in there. Uh, another source besides rivers is just direct littering, you know, on coastlines. So you have coastal populations living close to the shore, um, and they also have mismanaged plastic waste that can make its way into the ocean. And again, very often you hear this estimate of like 8 million tons going into the ocean per year. Uh, there was the Genbeck study, um, there are different estimates, but it's again an order of a few million tons that enter the ocean from direct coast populations um, each year. Uh, and there's fisheries. So, you know, we, we are fishing. Uh, lots of the fishing gear we use is made of plastic, like the nets and buoys, floats, and, and so on. And so on. part of that also gets lost at sea or discarded. Um, the estimates are really uncertain how much that contributes to plastic pollution in the ocean. Um, currently, we think it's about 20% of total emissions, but that value really is quite uncertain and lots of work being done to, to you know, narrow that down and, and quantify it better. Uh, aquaculture, that's another one. Uh, essentially, we don't know. We don't know how much plastic is coming from, from those industries. We, so, we see a lot of uh, debris, especially in the North Pacific area, like the oyster space here at the bottom, you know, uh, used in oyster farms. But we don't really know how much um, uh, the dead source for plastic pollution is. Uh, that's shipping. Um, you know, you sometimes read in the news, like I think it was last year of Sri Lanka, uh, devastating accident, you know, um, cargo vessel sinking with it, lots of pellets being released into the environment and to make it even worse, lots of chemicals that are now, you know, associated with these pellets uh, because they absorb those chemicals. They end up on, on the coast line in Sri Lanka. Uh, you see that just like everywhere, you can't barely see the sand anymore, just white beaches because of plastic pellets. Uh, so that is, let's say, you know, losing plastic at the really beginning of the supply chain. But then you can also have, you know, products that are being released because there are container losses. Um, so, for example, we have an example here in the North Sea uh, where the MSUI lost lots of containers uh, that led to, you know, stuff accumulating on, on the Dutch coastline here on the upper right. So lots of items, you know, lost in containers and they're just, you know, beaching onto the nearby uh, coastlines. And we don't know how much that is contributing to plastic in the ocean. It's very difficult to quantify. Uh, so those are the main sources. You see there's lots of uncertainty still about the sources, but I think we have a rather good understanding of what happens to it in the ocean in terms of, you know, uh, fluxes um, and compartments it's ending up in the ocean. Let's say the surface, seabed, water column. But what we do not know is, you know, the magnitude of those fluxes and, you know, 
also how much is in each of the compartments. So that really is, you know, uh, lots of research groups are working on that to try to quantify plastic fluxes and accumulation. Well, then we know about a, a third of, you know, plastic produced globally is more dense than seawater. So we know that sinks when it enters the ocean. So that is not a big surprise. Uh, and you, you can see photos like that. So images like that, the one is taken off the coast of Italy, uh, just, you know, big garbage, uh, dumps essentially where plastic is just you know, accumulating on the seabed. But then for the other two thirds of plastic, they are made of polymers that float in seawater. So they're less dense than seawater. Uh, and for that, you know, we, we can make these numerical simulations where we, where we simulate how particles move around in the ocean with currents and, and wind. And you can see, you know, in this example, we just release random particles from, from river models. Uh, and we see what happens to them. And you can see that there's these patches forming, like so areas with lots of particles. They are in the subtropical gyres. Uh, so that's the infamous ocean garbage patches. So through the ocean currents, floating debris is accumulating in these areas. But you also see you know, other accumulation areas in the Mediterranean Sea, especially in the east, and also in the Bay of Bengal. And you can also see that these garbage patches, they're very dynamic. They're not just an island, they really move around, you know, then go west, go east, go up and south. So it's very dy dynamic systems. And we can use those models to then come up with an estimate of, you know, how much plastic is floating uh, in the global ocean. Uh, and you can see here uh, one of our estimates and you can clearly see that the garbage patches again. And so for the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll focus on the North Pacific garbage patch. That's the one here in the middle between uh, US West Coast and Hawaii. Uh, no, we were doing a lot of research in that area, and so we think that this garbage patch contains about 50% of all the plastic afloats at sea. Uh, and like I said, it's, this exists because of the currents that accumulate debris in this area. Uh, but then there's a lot of misconception about the garbage patch, and I guess some of you might have seen the Seaspiracy documentary on Netflix. Um, in there, there was a discussion like, hey, it's it's mostly fishing nets, um, like half of it is fishing nets. And that's actually based on a study that we published in 2018. Uh, but then in the same uh, documentary, but also if we go to the National Geographic website, for example, you see that uh, claims being made, no, those patches are actually just tiny bits of plastic. They're all they are made of microplastic. So it's mostly microplastic. So, so what is it now? Is it fishing nets or is it microplastics? Uh, first of all, it's not an island of trash. That's a photo I took from the garbage patch. Um, and you can see it's not an island of trash. But it, what it is, is, you know, um, it is both, it is fishing nets, but also microplastics. And, and so here you see a graph, you see on the x-axis, you see, you know, different sizes of plastic objects, very small on the left. So that's microplastic. And then if you go right, you see larger plastic items uh, up to large than 50 centimeters. So those are mostly nets. And, and the y-axis just gives you the, the concentration, so amount of debris items per sea surface area. And you, you can see the gray line, that's, you know, the numer numerical concentration, meaning number of items per area. And the blue line is the, the mass, plastic mass per area. And you can see on, on the left, you know, if you look at the number of items, it's mostly tiny bits, it's mostly microplastic. Uh, if you look at the mass of plastic, it's mostly in this bigger objects. So, it depends how we talk about it. So if you want to talk about the plastic mass in, in the garbage patch, it's mostly big items, fishing nets. If you want, want to talk about the you know, number of items, it's mostly microplastics. And, and so, for example, you know, why don't we see that? Remember the photo I just showed you? It just looks like very pristine ocean surface area. Uh, it's because the big stuff is really dispersed. Like, like here, we, we fly drones in the garbage patch, and then we map objects. You see a map here. Uh, you see the blue... Uh, um, rectangles or areas, those are the photos being taken by the drone, stitched together, and then you see the red dots are items that we find, uh, and that the size of the dot represents the size of the item. So you can see there are lots of big items, uh, big uh, floating objects, but they are really dispersed, so that's why I don't really see them as an island of trash. Uh, and the microplastics, they are there, but you have to zoom in, so if you take the same photo and you just zoom in a bit, you can see that there's lots of microplastics, but you just don't see them from from far away. And as you might know, we are the ocean cleanup, so we are trying to clean the garbage patch. I would like to show you this video of one of our extractions that happened in October last year, almost a year ago now. Crazy how time flies. So what you can see here is another one of the extractions. So we take it on, on board 
um, and, and we empty our retention zone. That's you know, the part of the cleanup system that is accumulating the plastic. And that gives an idea of uh, what kind of items are floating out there in the North Pacific gyre. Uh, and you know, if you look carefully, you see lots of, of nets, like I just said before, but you can also see many buoys, you see those baskets, you see some containers, drums, um, there are lots of different items. And so what we do is we put up everything on the deck. And then once we, we emptied the retention zone, we start sorting it. So as you see our crew going through all the items, you know, classifying them into different debris uh, types. It's crazy the amount. Uh, and so we can learn a lot of, from, from cleaning and, and monitoring that. So uh, here you see two pie charts. You know, the one on the left is, you know, we, we analyze the catch that we have on the cleanup system. And we look at, you know, where is it coming from? So sometimes there are clues of origin on there. Like we know that this object is from Japan. We know that one is from China or US or Korea. So we, we can identify that for some objects and look at, you know, where they're coming from. And you see that most of the items we see in the garbage patch, they are from Japan, China, Korean Peninsula and the US. If you look at, you know, river inputs, um, we think that rivers are the main source for plastic pollution. And you look at, you know, where are the dominating rivers? bringing in most plastic into the ocean, specifically also into the North Pacific in this case. Um, you know, it, we should find lots of stuff from the Philippines, from India, Malaysia, China is there, but number four. So that's this mismatch, what we find floating in the garbage patch and, you know, what we think is mainly entering the ocean. Uh, so clearly the, the trash we find in the garbage patch is not only coming from rivers, uh, but interestingly, all those nations, they were representing um, fishing nations, important fishing nations in the region. And so with some further analysis that we did and modeling, we actually came up with, you know, 80% of the plastic in the garbage patch by mass is coming from fishing activities and it is not coming from rivers. So 80% of the plastic there is uh, from the from marine based sources like fishing. Um, and, and the reason for that is that, you know, you have the rivers that bring plastic into the ocean, but that plastic has a tendency to stick around the coastlines. I mean, just to a beach uh, walk and you see lots of plastic on the, on your coastline. Um, and so that's where most of the plastic, floating plastic, is ending up that enters from rivers. So it mostly stays in coastal environments. It beaches onto the shores. It can, you know, flush into the ocean again, but it tends to stay in these coastal areas. Uh, whereas if, if you lose an item at sea, like if you're fishing, then there's no coastline. So with the currents, that is, it just tends to accumulate in these garbage patches. Um, so it really depends on, on the release location where you lose your plastic item or any kind of floating debris. If you lose that sea, it has a tendency to accumulate in garbage patches. If you lose it in a river or close to a coast, it has a tendency to accumulate on those coastlines. And, and there's a really nice paper about that by Carmen Morales Caceres. It was published last year and you know where she looked into what is the composition of plastic or and waste generally that we see in different um, areas. And you have here the river waters, you have shorelines, near shore waters, and open waters. And you see many different colors. And I just want you to mainly look at the colors. So you see red, that's that's takeout consumer goods. You know, that's that's packaging, single-use plastics, the stuff that we see accumulating on our streets and our coastlines. Uh, and you see that, you know, if you're close to the coast, it's really mostly red. If, if you go into the open ocean, it, it becomes more blue. So then and blue is related to ocean and waterway. So in that case, marine-based sources of plastic. So that's really this, you know, inshore, offshore sort, sorting system where most of the plastic items coming into the ocean from rivers and land tend to stick around there. And what you see in the open ocean is mainly fishing related or let's say debris from marine, so, uh, uh, marine sources like fishing, uh, aquaculture or shipping. So to conclude that part of the, of the talk, you know, I think that I want to keep it really simple to just bring across this, this take home message, you know, that most plastic that we emit from land accumulates in coastal environments. And if plastic is emitted at sea, it has a high chance of accumulating in ocean garbage patches. Only talking about the floating fraction here. We know that stuff that does not float sinks, so that's not a big surprise. Uh, and it's really also important to realize that plastic pollution differs in different marine compartments. So, you know, if, if you hear claims in the media saying, hey, it's, it's mostly straws, it's mostly plastic bags, that might be true for some of the beaches, uh, but it's not true if you go further offshore. On the other hand, if you see studies saying or media claiming it's mostly fishing gear, yeah, if you're in a garbage patch, but not if you're on the coastline. Um, 
So it, it really, uh, we need to have this nuanced discussion and it differs from compartments. And really the key is that the release location really matters because of the beaching effect. So, and with the, the other half of my presentation, I would like now to focus on, on the ocean cleanup. As so for those of you who do not know us, we are a Dutch nonprofit founded in 2013 and our headquarter is in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, and so our aim is to remove 90% of floating plastic debris for 2040. Quite ambitious, but we, we are optimistic that we can achieve that. And so how do we do that? And so we have three main pillars in, in the work that we do. It's one of it is research where I'm part of, you know, where we try to improve the understanding of the problem because we're convinced, you know, if, if we want to solve the problem, we need to, to understand it. Uh, so that's, that's why we do this research. And then we have for the cleanup part, we have two, two different parts. We have the, a source reduction where we intercept plastic in rivers. And we know we, we go out there and remove what we call legacy plastic. So plastic that's already in the ocean and has been accumulating there for, for decades or years. And we remove that. And so I would like to, to start with, you know, so why, why focus on the rivers? Why, why not go further upstream and, you know, and make sure we don't produce that much plastic? Um, and so I cannot see the chat here, but maybe if, if, if you can type, I don't know that, but I want to ask the question of, you know, we, we know that about 400 million metric tons are produced uh, currently in plastic uh, production. Uh, and I want you, you know, to think about how much you think of that 400 million metric tons is ending up in the ocean. And so let's see if I can see the chat. I don't even know if you can text here, but just give you like a few seconds to think about it. You know, I think it's like 1%, is it 50%? It's almost all of that ending up in the ocean. And, and so, and this might come to a surprise to, to many of, of you, and I see this in many talks I give, it's, you know, I uh, just have to go over here. It's less than 1%. So really it's, we produce so much plastic and a lot of it is ending up in the ocean. But if you look at the numbers, it's about 1% or even less than 1% of the global plastic production ending up in the ocean. So it, it's it's not a lot, but it is a lot in terms of absolute terms. And we, we see that plastic in the oceans as a lot of it is going into the ocean. This just shows how much we actually produce of that. And so, you know, if, if you want to make sure that plastic is not ending up, up in the ocean, um, you can focus on that red dot down there uh, very efficiently. So because that, that number is smaller, so there's less plastic you have to you know focus on. And, and so that's what we do. We focus on, you know, reducing that red dot. But obviously what we want to do is, you know, we want to go further upstream eventually because it's not sustainable to keep cleaning. We want to make sure that eventually we don't have to clean anymore. So we're out of business. Uh, but that takes time. You know, it's a big shift to turn and it's a billion investment, um, big industries. So yes, we want to get there. We want to cap production. You know, we want to figure it out with the plastic treaty on, you know, how to, how to manage that better. Waste management infrastructure, that's more like the dark blue dots here we want to tackle. So there's a lot of very important work that we need to do and it's being done, but we tend to focus on the red dot here just to, to give us time to, you know, um, to figure out more sustainable way of production and usage of plastic. So that, that's why we focus on rivers. Um, and how do we do that? So you might have seen the, our interceptor, that's this the one here on the top. Um, you know, it's this machine that has a a barrier in front of it that, you know, accumulates floating plastic that goes into the conveyor belt or onto the conveyor belt and the conveyor belt then distributes it automatically over the different dumpsters that we have. And once they're full, we get a message and we can go and then empty them. Uh, we have many of them deployed already, in Indonesia to Malaysia, Vietnam, Dominican Republic. And actually next week, there will be a live stream where we deploy the the next interceptor in LA. So just check out our website if you want to watch the live stream of you know how we how we install the, the next interceptor in LA. But then that's not the only solution that we have for rivers because all the, the rivers are different. So it does not it's a great tool, but it doesn't work for all the rivers. So that's we are that's why we're developing a portfolio of solutions. Uh, for example, here in Jamaica, you see uh, our interceptor Barry on tender. So we have these gullies in you know the capital of Jamaica canals. Uh, where, we have, where we install the barriers and then we um, occasionally go and empty the debris that's accumulated there. If you go to Guatemala, for example, we have the interceptor trash vents that we're installing and testing there. Um, here you see a photo of one of the tests. Um, just for reference, you know that we, we're talking about three meters high. So the, the mesh that you see that the plastic is accumulating is three meters high. So it's really lots of plastic, plastic trash in there. And we, we aim to, you know, intercept plastic in the 1,000 most polluting rivers 
because our models show that they are responsible for about 80% of the global river and plastic emissions. All good. So I think, uh, I hope I could just inform a little bit why we focus on rivers and how we do that. But the question that we hear very often is also, why do you try to clean up ocean garbage patches? So expensive and so difficult to do. And I mean, I want to show you this map here. And that's our model estimate of where the plastic is floating in the ocean. I want you to think about what happens if we now are actually able to turn off the tap. Let's say if we manage to have no more plastic entering the ocean from rivers or coastlines in general, how would that map change? I'm gonna let it run here. That's what our model predicts. So you see that the coastlines are essentially gone. That means you know that if, if we manage that, that a uh, source of plastic will really make a dent in plastic pollution in coastal environments. But the garbage patches, they remain. So we see, you know, they're very persistent. We have objects in there that are decades old. We see that, you know, it's it has a, um, a tendency to accumulate over decades and years, and it's just uh, going away by itself. And so that's why we also focus on, on those garbage patches, because if you really want to read the oceans of plastic, then there's still this, you know, this issue to tackle here, which are the garbage patches. And also, if you remember at the beginning of my talk, that, that the plastic in there, it's not necessarily from rivers. So it's also from marine-based sources, and you're not tackling those if, if you're intercepting rivers. And so how do we do that? Uh, so we use our models, and we're getting really good uh, at you know, predicting where plastic accumulates, especially in the North Pacific area, where that's our main area of focus for the offshore cleanup at the moment. And we can actually make daily forecasts of you know, where we think the plastic is. You see on the right, you see a map, you see the, you know, the, the cross, that's the position of the vessel, uh, of the cleanup system. And then we have this, this area, so you know, the bright colors is where we predict a lot of plastic. And it, we're, we're getting really good at that. And that helps us to target those hotspots within the garbage patch. Because remember the garbage patch is not an island. So it has hotspots, areas with a lot of plastic. And we want to focus on them to have a very efficient cleanup. And so we have, uh, developed the first system back in 2018, system 001, uh, which was called Wilson. There was a passive approach, you see on the upper left, there was essentially just a, you know, a floating barrier structure with a screen, uh, and it was drifting freely with the currents and winds. Uh, we, we had, it worked, but it also did not work, and we had some issues with the structural integrity, so it broke at the end of the testing campaign. And also it was difficult for us to retrain the plastic in the system. So what, what you really need to, to, to accumulate the plastic, you need to be either always faster than it or slower than it that it comes into a cleanup system. And with the passive approach, we had difficulties, you know, um, keeping that difference between the speed of plastic and speed of the cleanup system. So that's why I went out again with the system 1B, where we played around with you know, making it faster, making it slower. Uh, and it worked. So with this parachute that we put in the water and made it slower, so it turned around, the, the plastic actually came into the system that worked pretty well. But if we, if we then do the calculations, uh, we saw that, you know, it's just not efficient enough to really scale up. Uh, we would need many of those systems. They would drift out. We had to go with the vessel, throw it back into the garbage patch. So the economics were just not working out. And so now we have system two, which is called Jenny. It is out there since summer last year, so more than a year now already, very successfully uh, cleaning, and we learned a lot uh, from the system. Uh, so far, we have removed over a hundred tons of plastic in the garbage patch, and we are now slowly transitioning into system three. So you hear, here in the middle, you see system two. System three will be um, going from 800 meters, which is the length of system two, to two and a half kilometers, and system three, so it's going to be quite big. And so, and how we get from two to three is, you know, we, we add components to it. So we don't just go immediately big, but we, we go big slowly. So first we replace the retention zone. That's this, you know, the little thing you see at the end where plastic accumulates. I made that bigger and then now we're increasing the, the wings. Uh, and why we do that is we want to test and see, you know, um, how the system behaves. And importantly, also, if we see any changes in impact on marine life, so we closely monitor that to make sure that we have uh, no, no negative impact on the ecosystem out there. And with that, you know, if, if you want to help us out, uh, it would be really amazing. So we have the Citizen Science, uh, the Ocean Cleanup Survey app, and you can download it for, for Google or Android, uh, and you can start monitor plastic you see floating in rivers or on the ocean, and, you know, the data is then shared with us to improve our models. You know, the ones I showed you that we use to predict where plastic is coming from, where it goes to, 
So we can really target those areas for cleanup. Yes, and that was my last slide already. So yeah, thanks for your attention. Looking forward to the discussion. Um, drop me an email if you want to know more about it, or to go to my website or also the Austrian website. Thank you so much, Matthias. Um, it's it's great to hear to see the work that that's being done and all the models that have gone into it. Uh, I see there have been some questions in the Q and A box here. Um, the one is saying, "Excellent presentation. Thank you." Um, my question is, which software did you use for the modeling? I'm not sure if that'll have a few different answers depending on the. There were a few models that you had there. Um, yes, that's a good question. I'm not the one doing the models, <laughs> so I'm not an expert in that. I'm more the field scientist getting the data for the models. I know they use MATLAB, I know they, know, they use Python, uh, and also general ocean circulation models like ROMs, for example, HICOM, for the models that are already out there. Uh, we're working with them as far as I can see. Okay, uh, th thanks for that. And then there's, a, I think there was a response to your question about how much plastic um, is, is sort of being found. Um, uh, I think there was a slight issue with the chat box, um, which has been resolved now. Um, but I think that was um, a, a bit of an overestimation. I, I believe you said less than 1% uh, stays on land. So very interesting there. Then we have a, another question that says, do you have any interceptors for episodic rivers, rivers that only flow some of the time? Yes, uh, very good question. But they are not the interceptor originals, one of the big machines. The one I showed in Guatemala, for example, where we put in a fence there. That has very low, uh, very low water velocity, but water flow throughout the year. But when the rain season comes, and you have this flash flood, and, and so for that we have this kind of fence system. You know that just when the, the flood comes, it can retrain that plastic. So, but we're also looking into other options. So, because each river is different, right? So we have to come up with the best solution for each river. Okay. Um, on that on that note, um, was there quite a um, a design process involved in setting up the fence system? Because I can imagine accounting for all the variables there, whether it be sort of the biological material or just the sheer force of the water, there could be a bit of a trial and error situation happening. Yes, uh, the photo I showed you that we made plastic, but we lost that plastic again because you know that the system failed and it was just uh, the problem is at the at the river bed. You know, it was under washing it. Mm -hmm. And so the plants went out underneath it. So we were still learning by deploying and improving constantly. And uh, the system itself is being taken from, uh, you know, um, actually from Swiss mountains where I'm based here. Uh, and there, I was English word for that, for the avalanche uh, to, you know, protect people from, you know, snow coming down or rocks <laughs> onto the roads here in Switzerland or from the mountains. So we, we try to not reinvent the wheel and, you know, take technology that's already out there put it there and test it and see how it performs. Okay, uh, so sorry, was it the Avalanche setup that was trialed earlier or is that the current one that's that's being tested? It is the, the one that has been tested and I think okay. it's the one that is being tested. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, then there's a, another question that says, thank you for the interesting presentation. Do you perhaps have an estimate for us on how much it costs to remove plastic debris from the ocean per ton? Yes, I can imagine there are like, Two really, well, three really big questions that we are working on. Uh, the first one is cost. Obviously, you know, we need money and it needs to be as cheap as possible. Carbon emissions, that's the other big one we're focusing on at the moment, and impact on marine life. So that we're really working on that. And so in terms of costs, they're pretty high, it's expensive. It's really vessels that cost a lot of money. Uh, our target is to go to 10 euros, 10 USD, it's about the same these days, per kilogram of plastic. 10 USD per kilogram for the ocean. Okay, uh, then there's a, another question that says, uh, great talk, thank you. Have you done any studies to determine if your machines collect debris harm aquatic life and how do you prevent aquatic bycatch? Yeah, again, excellent question. Those are the questions that we have as well. Um, so and that is one of the main reasons why we have one system in there and we not 10 and we're slowly increasing it. So we look at, we have like independent uh, monitor uh, observers on, on our vessels that look for protected marine species. Uh, we have also on the retention zone, that's the area of the cleanup system that accumulates plastic. We have a camera there, so we can actually see if there's a protected species, like a turtle swimming in there. There are escape routes for, for fish, there are like also hatches to, you know, to breathe for animals that need to surface. So we would monitor that and keep in mind that we're towing very slowly, like half of normal walking speed. So we see fish is swimming in and out, and the system is open at the, at the bottom, so they can just 
just three meters deep so they can just swim underneath it. Uh, we have like lights that are, you know, making sure that the fish don't like it here. We have kind of like black sounds to make sure that you know, we are making sure that no species want to get here. So we monitor or monitor that closely. Uh, we also look at the bycatch. There is bycatch. It's not a lot, but we, we look at the bycatch. We also collaborate with the universities uh, or on Hawaii, for example, to look at you know the microplastic ingested by those fish. We can also learn about their, their health. What we see is that if we have bycatch, for example, in the turtle, very often those turtles are in really poor health conditions, already dead. Um, and so now we do. Um, we open them up and we look at you know what they have in the stomach, and in the guts, and you know also report that to get an idea of you know are we only impacting sick animals or healthy animals. Also, there was a lot of research being done at the moment. We are really happy with how it goes. Uh, another aspect is the newston, so that's all the, the small jelly and a lot of marine life that floats at the very top of the ocean, uh, which we do not intend to harm, obviously. So we are monitoring that closely. Of what is our impact? How can we play around with the system configuration to make sure that we are not, you know, having those in our body? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, then the next question is, um, thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, how do you, uh, or the Ocean Cleanup, fund your cleanups? Yeah, donations. It's all based on donations. Okay. Uh, then uh, we have another one going, uh, do you often find plastic covered in biogrowth at the surface or when pulling plastic from the ocean? Um, I know you, you briefly referred to that, but can you comment at all on the, the, the large volumes that come onto the ship? Is there much um, biogrowth on those? Um, it depends. I mean, if, if you look at the video, and uh, actually if you're following our social media channels, there has been a discussion that we are faking our, our operations because the plastic looks so clean. Which it shouldn't, because it's floating in the ocean, right? So that two things to it. Um, first of all, we are operating in the gyre, so that's a part of the ocean that has very low productivity, because most nutrients they don't make it out there, because there's no upwelling, and the rivers are far away. So there's not much growth, but there is growth on items, uh, like the, the gooseneck barnacles, kind of like mussels growing on them. Some of objects, some of the objects are covered with them, some have zero, so we don't really understand what is leading to their attachment, detachment. Uh, so there could be certain additives added to the plastic objects that we know make sure that it's... Because it's mostly fish in here, right? And fish and don't want their stuff to overgrow. So there's also chemicals added to, to, to avoid that. It's a complex system. We do see animals living on the, on, the, on the items, and we actually also study that. Because we see that many of those species, they are invasive species that do not belong out there. Lots of frozen species from Japan, Tsunami, for example. Uh, and so we also try to understand, you know, this is now a good thing if we remove that uh, organisms that are on the plastic um, or not. I mean, there are two aspects of it. There's an ecosystem, invasive species, but then also those animals have a right to live. So it's ethically, morally, uh, you know, justified to, to take them out of the ocean. So those, those are the questions that we want to know. Okay, uh, thank you. Then the next question is, how are the areas chosen? Um, the areas that specifically in the sea that will be cleaned? Yes, with a uh, no, it's our models predicting where the plastic is, and the models are based on data that we collect. So we have expeditions going out at sea, collect data on concentration of plastic, types of plastic. We feed that into our models, which can then predict where we should focus our cleanup efforts. Okay. Uh if anyone does have any further questions, you're, you're welcome to send those through. Uh, in the meantime, in the video that you showed of the river-based um, the, the river uh, collection system, there was quite a bit of um, biological material washing up there as well and being caught. Are there any sort of projects in the works that are looking to maybe deal with those kinds of volumes of biological waste that are, that are also being captured? Um, or is that sort of just filtered out in the sorting process? Because I imagine that could also add quite a bit of time and effort and manpower and therefore cost as well. Yes, uh, not a good question. So the, 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 the plants that you saw, those are water hyacinths. They are an invasive species. I mean, you, you know them, but they're really a problem in many you know, different uh, cities and rivers uh, because they are just clogging the whole river system. And sometimes they're forming islands, you can actually walk on them, which is covering up the whole uh, river surface. And yes, there's a depending on the river that we're operating, there can be a lot of water hyacinths in there. Um, it's actually a good thing to remove them because they have an impact on the dynamics and you know, oxygen levels in coastal waters. So, and also for a hazard for you know, shipping uh, in the rivers. 
So we are removing them, and then we also analyze what is extraction, how much is organic waste we collect, or organic debris, I have to say, and how much is plastic debris or plastic waste, and try to figure out what's the composition. And but that that's the level that we approach. In the okay, um, and then in the the goal that the ocean cleanup is working towards uh, of reducing 90% of the floating litter, is that 90% of the legacy litter, as you stated, or is that sort of projecting the volumes for 2040 and saying you're going to reduce 90% of that? Well, it's the assumption that we have the, the current status as uh, the baseline, but obviously we're also working on intercepted plastic in rivers, so we want to have 90% of all the plastic that's out there now uh, being removed from them. Okay, um, and then just in terms of some of the specs of the, the the equipment that you're working with, the depth of the nets, can you comment at all on on that as well as um, maybe uh, touching on some of the challenges that you've faced? I know you I know you did briefly talk about those in terms of the evolution of the the system, um, but perhaps the the area that's covered from the nets in terms of um, surface area and in terms of depth. Yes. Question, yeah. um, the depth is three meters. Uh, we are now going to increase, increase that to four meters with the system three. Uh, so it's very shallow. We're really focusing on the, the floating plastic here. Uh, the span, like I said, is 800 meters now. We go to two and a half kilometers eventually with system three. And, you know, we can vary the span depending on conditions, but it's a few hundred meters in the span usually. So that gives you the area that you can cover. You can it for depending on many different things like weather conditions, you know. Um, sea state for a couple of days usually uh, to swept the area and so that uh, the problems that we have or have had with the previous approaches like i said is you no know, ideally we want to have a passive system it needs no vessels um, but that works but it's just not scalable and uh, it's also how do you then monitor you know the impact possibly impact the marine life how can you monitor that without having a vessel out there and also if you then slow it down they tend to really drift out as well, so you need vessels to throw them back in. That's a lot of money, that's a lot of carbon emissions, and if you do the calculations, it's actually better just directly, actively, you know, throw them with um, the vessels. We are looking into ways of, you know, optimizing that, because the vessels, that's where most of our costs are, and that's where most of our carbon emissions are. So if we can get rid of that, or, you know, decrease that, then that would be great for a community reason. So we're working on that very intensively. To, to make sure that we, we are optimizing that part as well. All right. And in terms of the expanding the area, will that not have um, additional challenges in terms of the volume that you're catching? And surely there's a sort of threshold that the nets can hold, handle, basically. Yes, you're asking all the right questions. Yes, <laughs> uh, of course. Eventually, we might have the, the, the problem that we're catching too much. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're out there. So it takes one week to sail out there. So okay. if all of a sudden you have too much plastic, it's not like you can just call them and say, hey, send a second vessel, because there's no way you can put it. So you have to make sure that you also plan for that. Now uh, you see that we, what we do first is we increase the retention zone. That's kind of like a small bag at the end of the, the system uh, where the plastic accumulates. And that gives us the threshold of that volume we can extract in one go. So we want to make sure that that volume also fits off the deck of the vessel, uh, that we have enough containers on the vessel. So we also look into, you know, do we need bigger vessels eventually, or different kind of vessels, or a support vessel that's there for just extracting and not towing? Um, yes, and uh, also for you know, if, if you now increase it from three to four meters, what's the drag? What's drag on you know the cables? Uh, also, what's the impact of that on the fuel consumption? Because if you have a higher drag, you need more power to propel, so thereby you're burning more fuel again, which is not what we want. So yes, um, our team is working on that, and you know we we're modeling that, and I think. Really, what we important thing here to make or for a statement to make is it's, it's so meaningful to have a system out there now, even though it's expensive, you know, it's not perfect yet, but we can learn a lot. And we are doing some R&D and tests to see, okay, if you do A, what happens with it? You know, if you change that configuration, what does it mean for our operations? How does this impact the scalability of the solution? No, d definitely worthwhile to have have the model running and sort of work from there rather than keeping everything hypothetical until you have all of the solutions um, yeah, ready to go. Um, in the video that you showed with the hole coming out of the water and onto the, the boats, can you, I'm not sure if you have any details about that, but can you maybe 
give us an estimate as to how much distance had been covered for that haul? And is that sort of the average haul that's brought in? Or was that a particular, um, uh, an outlier? Uh, I don't have the area. Okay. Um, I sure. Give you that number. I'm sorry for that. Uh, no in terms of the, the video I showed, uh, I can also go back to it. So, I hope you can. Can you see some of PowerPoint? Yes, yes, we can still see it. Okay, uh, let's just play that down again here. Sure. So, not, not, not to put you on the spot in terms of yeah, volumes no. and that, but just to get an, an estimate of if this is a standard um, haul that's brought in and sort of at what scale um, this represents of the floating plastic. Yes, uh, and that's a good question. It's not putting you on the spot, that's an awesome question. So I just want to show you here, so, because here's the number, I did not have the number on top of my head. So it's, this was 9 ton. Uh, it was one of the biggest ones we had about a year ago, uh, but since then we are able, able to reproduce that. And actually we have catches that are 10 tons and higher for deployment. Deployment is usually, you know, two, three, four days, depending on the conditions. Uh, you could do the math of, you know, we're towing at about 0.5 or 1 knots, and we have like a 600 meter span that gives you your area. So we talk about a few, couple of square kilometers that we are cleaning. Uh, but this is not the exception. So we had some challenges with, you know, in the beginning. So we were not always able to reproduce that. But since then we've made adjustments to Jenny cleanup system. Uh, and so a catch like this is very common these days for a couple of days of long. Okay. Um, and then just one last question before we close off. I don't see any that have come through in the chat that remain unanswered. But in terms of the, the waste that you've collected, what then happens to it when you take it back to shore? Is any of it recyclable or does it all end up going to landfill or any other end of life solutions there? Yes, uh, another great question. It, so it depends whether you're operating in a river or in the ocean, because like I said, the composition is very different. Uh, the good thing is that, well, the good thing is, <laughs> I mean, the plastic accumulating in the open ocean that has been sorted already in the bottom of the ocean. So we see mostly polyethylene, polypropylene, that's the main polymer types you see. Uh, it's mostly thick items, you know, uh, because they need to be taking a float, they need to be, you know, there's like a lot of wave breaking, there's solar radiation, so they need to, you know, persist on the ocean surface. So yes, we can recycle most of that. So we did a, a proof of concept uh, last year, and the year before last year, <laughs> before COVID came, uh, and we took all the, the, the nets that we collected with the system 1B and recycled that into our sunglasses. So then we had a salt and the profit was then reinvested in cleanup. Um, so we, we know we can do that. Uh, as for the rigid, so the hard items, we're also doing research on that to try to recycle it as much as possible because that's the aim. We want to recycle it. Also, it's a very um, intuitive value for us because, you know, that's the resource that we have that, that we can share. Um, we are no longer trying to make our own products like the sunglasses, but now we're looking into partnerships. You know, partnering up with uh, other companies that can then use our plastic for, for their products. For, for the river, it's different. It's also know if you are in the open ocean, it's international waters. If you collect it, it becomes Dutch waste. So we are responsible for it. If we operate in a river, uh, you know that the river belongs to the you know, province or a nation of this restriction. So they are responsible for that, and we always dispose of the best local practices. And so we give it to the, into the hands of the local operator and local infrastructure to then you know come up with the best solution for the plastic for each individual river. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I see there are two more questions that have popped through. Uh, the one is uh, from your observations so far, has the mass of plastic that's been collected decreased? Good question. I'm, I'm working on analyzing the data for uh, publication next year. I don't think so. Um, well, that, that's just a guess. I mean, we have, we're collecting data and we're analyzing it. But we, we see that, you know, we have an exponential increase in production and, you know, we are just not there yet with our scale up. We're still in the testing phase and slowly scaling up. Uh, there are also organizations like, you know, Ocean Voyage Institute, for example, removing plastic in the same area, doing a great job. Lots of beach cleanups are removing plastic from, from the environment. So it's very difficult to quantify how much is being removed versus how much is accumulating in the ocean. Uh, but we try to actually monitor that because eventually we want to measure what is our impact. So we are now currently at the stage where we set the baseline of what we think, how much plastic is there. And we keep monitoring and we want to see a net reduction. If we do not get there, then obviously our approach is not working. 
something we have to reconsider. But yes, monitoring our impact will be crucial. It also helps to monitor, let's say, you know, because we look at different items. So you can see a ban on plastic bags, for example. Do we see a net reduction in plastic bags in environmental straws? And we can also you know, give a tool to you know, other parties, or like the plastic treaty, let's say, how to start. You know, provide the data for the polit politicians to make informed decisions and also you know, to hold them accountable with the monitoring of the impact that different policies have on plastic inclusion. Um, thank you. The, the, the role of monitoring is certainly vital for measuring the impact of different interventions. So, so it's great to hear that, um, that the monitoring is ongoing and the, the link between bans and, and any sort of policy implementation. Then one final question that I see here. Um, do you have issues with, of theft of river devices in other countries? Yes, yes, we do. It sounds like there's someone speaking from experience. Uh, <laughs> that, that is indeed a challenge that we are facing, yes. Uh, it, it is for our cleanup system, but also for our research in the rivers. So where we deploy cameras on bridges to monitor plastic floating down in the river. Uh, and that is an issue. Cameras being stolen, uh, things being stolen from the interceptor. Uh, so now we have like 24 seven uh, men or uh, someone on, on the interceptor to avoid that. Actually, we have a dog. One of the interceptors in Malaysia <laughs> that's going off somewhere I know potential burglars. So yes, that is an issue, uh, and it is being addressed. But it is uh, one of the key challenges that we have. Um, thank you, thank you so much. I think I think we can end the questions here for today. But if anyone does have any questions, you're welcome to send those through to us or to uh, Matthias. I believe you shared your your email there at the end. Um, Thank you, everyone, for, for sending through the questions and the comments. Um, it's, it's great to see the, the level of interaction. And I, so I think we'll close off here for today. Um, but a particular thank you, Matthias, for joining us today and for taking the time to, to take us through the, the Ocean Gyres, the work that, and in particular, obviously, the work that the Ocean Cleanup is doing. Um, I know there are a lot of challenges involved, but it's, it's really wonderful to see the, the, the progress that's been made and the sheer volumes of litter that are being removed from the ocean. And you know, then preventing the break, the further breakdown of the plastic as well. So, um, thank you everyone for joining and for all the engagements. And thank you, Matthias. Um, our sessions will be uploaded onto YouTube, and you can find any upcoming webinars on our events page. Uh, if you haven't already, you can also sign up for our mailing list to hear about any future upcoming series. So thank you so much, everyone. I think we'll close off here for today, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you again for joining, and thank you, Matthias. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.